Good. Welcome, everyone, to the lecture that begins one minute late. What a tragedy. Um, so let's pick off where we left off last time. Pick up. Left off last time. Uh, so last time we started with the whole um, argument that information processing is actually a, a thermodynamic um, is actually something that has thermodynamic considerations, that if we don't take these into account, we would get paradoxes. So Maxwell's demon was an example. But we could solve this paradox by noting that whenever you have information processing, you need to have a memory. A memory has to record results of a measurement. And then based on the state of the memory, you can do something interesting, like in the case of the Szilard engine. And the problem with this is even if you get something interesting by making measurements, you do this only at the cost of increasing the entropy of your memory. So the, the end result of uh, last time's lecture was a statement at minus delta of Sm, where m is the memory, plus or minus beta delta Eb was equal to and this was, well, I've written it in the weird fashion here, but minus Si of S M B minus D of rho B prime given rho B. And so therefore, you can say this is less or equal to 0, because the mutual information and the relative entropy are always positive quantities. So the best case scenario is where they're 0. So this was our our end point of last time's lecture. And so we could cast this in the form minus s memory is less or equal to beta delta of eb. Okay. Now, the one thing, I'm not sure I said this explicitly last time. So when we have um, a unitary operation, and that was what we had. So we, we took u rho s m b u dagger. That was the 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 description of the whole uh, whole process, then the energy change in the state rho has to come from somewhere because of global energy preservation. So we understand that whatever the change in the energy, the average energy of rho is, it must come from the machinery that does the unitary. So you can therefore associate any change in energy to work. So in this case here, when we, when we had our memory, we, we didn't take any Hamiltonian for the memory. It was just a case of um, changing the uh, entropy of it. And the system, remember, was cyclic. So we took the case of the Szilard engine. So we bring the system back to the same state. So the en only energy change was the increase in energy of the bar. Oh, I'm sorry. Not sure what rubbed or what, but. Yeah, so this is also equivalent to saying that delta EB we can associate with work. So this delta EB has to come from somewhere, so that check. OK. Um, this is going to be very tricky. Everything is conspiring to make this lecture a bit more difficult. Let's see. Uh, OK, so at the end of all of that, I associated the, cur the increase in energy of the heat path uh, to the work done. So we get. So I can write this now as minus delta S of M. Um, is less or equal to W. So this really gives you a, a lower bound on the amount of work that has to be done. So in particular, if you try to, to decrease the entropy of the memory, so you try to do something that decreases the entropy of the memory, then this is going to be a negative quantity. So the whole thing, negative of that uh, quantity, is going to be positive, And you see that W has to be greater than that. Sorry, I forgot a beta here. Okay. So one of the key examples, like in the case of the Szilard engine, where you just have the case of whether the particle is on the left or the right of the box, there the entropy increases are all about like one bit of entropy. So you could imagine, imagine I have um, a particular state of memory that starts out uh, maximally mixed, and I want to decrease its entropy. I want to make it pure so that it's now zero entropy. In that case, I would have that the, this quantity here for one bit decrease would just become a log of two. And so that would give us that W was greater or equal to. And I'll take the beta on the other side and write it in the traditional form, kt 
log of two. And so this is somehow one of the simplest ways and the most common way you'll see the concept of Landau erasure. If you want to erase one bit of entropy, you have to do this much of work. Now, I think I've, I've been using the word erase a lot, and this is essentially return memory yeah, to a pure state. Okay. Okay. Now, so that's fine. So now imagine I try to do this. So I, I sort of had an example at the last lecture, but it went very fast. So let me sort of do something similar again. So I actually have a bit uh, that I want to erase. So I'm going to do it explicitly. I'm going to take my Hamiltonian H of the system to be so zero. So this corresponds to having a Hamiltonian like this. So I have two energy states, but they're both at the same level. How would I, if, if this starts out now rho s, is identity over two. So I have equal population in both. And I want to now change the state uh, by using some unitary on, the, on this together with the bath. I want to change the state to one of just being in one of the state or the other. So let's call this one zero and this one one. And I want to be in the state zero. So I want to take this two, zero, zero. OK? Now, before we continue, one of the things I'm going to point out is that all of what we do here is sort of of the flavor of the second law of thermodynamics. But there's also the third law of thermodynamics. And, and something that you can see very clearly is, so imagine that I said, OK, I'm going to do, I have rho s tensor rho b. OK? And this, as usual, always starts out thermal. So I have, uh, this is a Gibbs state, e to the minus beta h b by z. And I do a unitary on this dagger. So of course, I'm going to go to rho s b prime. But what I want is that from rho s b prime, I need to see that rho s is only in the state 0, 0. But this, so I, I would like to, and this is a question mark, I would like this to be really 0, 0 s tensor rho b prime. Okay? Because now, why do I say this? If you have rho s b prime where the reduced state is just pure, then it has to be a tensor product. You cannot have that the reduced state of a system is pure and it, be, it not be a tensor product. But this is actually impossible. And how can we see this? Um, if I start with rho s being identity over 2, or for that matter, anything that's, um, that has eigenvalues both in 0 and 1, then what I see here is a full rank system. And by full rank, I mean if I look at the eigenvalues of this system, all of them are non-zero. So here, the, the eigenvalues are half and half. This is a Gibbs state, so every eigenvalue is positive, though of different values. And so the tensor product, of course, is going to have the product of the eigenvalues. Everything is non-zero. But the problem here is that this is not. This is now half the rank. Well, at least half the rank, less or equal to. So even if rho b prime is still full rank, the fact that I have only one eigenvalue here means when I look at the eigenvalues of the joint state, the ones corresponding to zero tensor some state in the bath, they are fine. But the ones corresponding to one tensor some state in the bath, all of those eigenvalues are zero because the state one does not appear here. So this is now half the rank. But this is a problem because we know that the unitaries, unitary operations preserve the eigenvalues. So the set of eigenvalues have to be the same. So if there are no zero eigenvalues here, there cannot be zero eigenvalues here. So now note that this is something that was not prevented by the equation and stuff that we had before. It doesn't say anything about the, the entropy decrease here can still be just one bit. And so we would expect that the work that we need is, is some finite quantity. This is something that's different, and this is why I call it a different sort of, this is sort of a version of the third law of thermodynamics. Now, the third law of thermodynamics has many, many forms, and the resource that, typically the, the, the statement of the third law of thermodynamics is that you try to get to some particular state perfectly, and usually that state involves some sort of purity, some sort of rank decreasing operation, so this would be a rank decreasing operation to go from identity over 2 to 0, 0. And whenever you do that, you see that it's impossible to do it perfectly. And as you get closer, so to go closer to rank decreasing operation, some resource must diverge. Okay? 
what that resource is, one easy example is energy sometimes. Another case may be just the number of operations or the time you take. So these are the typical things, the energy or the or amount of time or number of operations. And in fact, we will see in this lecture uh, both examples of what this is. So I'm leaving this quite general because really speaking, if you, if you look in the literature for anything to do with the third law, you'll find a really a variety of literature. But this is all, the, all of them will form sort of this statement that you go closer to a rank decreasing operation and something will have to diverge. Okay, so the first example now, which indeed demonstrates both the fact that you could do erasure or arbitrary close to it, but that something is going to diverge. Yes? Yeah? Yes. Yes. It actually depends on how you construct this unitary. So, I'm, so the, there are going to be two examples in this lecture, one with a single swap, in which case the resource will be energy that will diverge. This is what I'm doing next. And then one with many, many swaps where the, the energy does not diverge, but the number of swaps will then have to. So this is indeed the next example. So the easiest way I could imagine trying to do this, and indeed it's not that you, so when I say diverge, it means that you never get here, but for arbitrary close, something has to, to go higher and higher. So the easiest way of doing this would be the following. I just do a swap of my system with a qubit. So this is S. This is B, and I'm going to do the unitary swap between them. So it's the usual uh, 0, 1, 1, 0, plus 1, 0, 0, 1, plus, well, nothing on the rest. U, S, B is equal to that. So what do I get? So I start out with rho S equals identity over 2, rho B equals, so now this I label by EB. So rho B equals um, 1 upon 1 plus e to the minus beta EB, 0, 0, plus e to the minus beta EB upon 1 plus e to the minus beta EB, 1, 1. OK? Now, when I do the swap, of course, I see that uh, rho S prime is going to be this. So basically the state of, of B in the beginning, because under the swap, they just switch. And now I say, okay, my goal was to get S as much in the state zero as possible. So can I do this? Yes, I can. If I take EB to be larger and larger, this becomes closer to one. So as EB goes towards infinity, we have that one upon one plus E minus beta EB goes to one, and E to the minus beta EB upon 1 plus e to the minus beta eb goes to 0. So I know that if I take eb going to infinity, I get closer and closer to what I would like, that the final state of the system has a greater and greater population of being in 0. So I can get as close to erasure as I like. But what do we see? Well, what is the energy difference here? So what is w in this case? So this, the state, um, the energy of the system does not change. It does not have a Hamiltonian. So the only thing that changes is the energy of the bath. And so how do we calculate this? We see the final population of the, of the bath in the excited state. So this is going to be the energy of the excited state. The final population is just half, because the bath takes on the system state, and that's just maximally mixed. And the initial population is this. So e to the minus beta EB upon 1 plus e to the minus beta EB. OK? And now what happens? As EB goes to infinity, this goes to infinity. Why? Because this quantity here, this, this is a number, this is a population that's between half and zero. So whatever you do here, so actually as EB goes to zero, this tends to zero. So this whole thing tends to half. But in any case, it's finite and bounded. But EB, the multiplying factor, tends to infinity. So this goes to infinity. So I can get arbitrarily close to erasure, but at the cost of basically a diverging amount of work that I would have to do. Now, now we think of, let's, let's sort of think about this example in the context of what we had. Now, here, I, I've done it with system and memory, but now you can just ignore, you basically take M here to be the system and ignore the S, so you just have memory and bath, or system of bath, whatever you like it. Um, and we want to see, well, we have a W that's here, and we have a, a delta S, which is one bit in the case that I go 
closer and closer to Eurasia. But clearly, there's a massive gap in this inequality. And the massive gap must be explained by one of these terms, because I have an equality here. So if this is one bit, and this goes to infinity, then something over here must be going to infinity. And what can it be? It's not the mutual information, because one of the nice properties of the swap is that there's no mutual information. When you just swap the states, there's no correlation. You've just switched to the, the, the final um, entropy is still just additive, because you have a tensor product. So the only thing that can blow up is really this quantity. And this is where we see what's happening. This quantity here is the relative entropy of the final state of the bath to the initial state of the bath. And the initial state of the bath, of course, is, is thermal, so it's relative entropy of the final to a thermal state. But the final state of the bath is the state of the system. And that's just the maximally mixed state, half and half. And the point is, as this bath increases with the energy gap, higher and higher, then actually the, the state of the bath, rho b, tends to, as e b goes to infinity, it tends to 0, 0. So let's say 1 minus epsilon 0, 0, where epsilon is a small quantity, plus epsilon 1, 1. Okay. So just to say that you have a small quantity here. And the point then is that if you do rho, rho b, this relative entropy, so def you remember the definition of the relative entropy, you have to take the sum over, let's say, p prime n log of p prime n over p n, where p n are the populations. And now you see the, the problem. As EB goes to infinity, there is one PN here, the PN in the excited state, that is going to zero. So of course, log of PN prime by PN is going to blow up. So this is where we have a problem. So our problem really is that the change in the bath is too violent as we try to get close and close to erasure. So this is the same as saying we are, so this is highly irreversible and also very much not isothermal which is that we really are changing the, the state of, we are changing a thermal state to something that's really far from a thermal. OK, so how do we rectify this problem? Well, we try to make the changes in state as small as possible. So now we modify that, that um, this, let's say, process or protocol. Here we had one single swap to go from here to there. Now we're going to do something much more gentle. We are going to write, so we have our system. So I'm going to do this this way. So we have our system Hamilton in here. So this is our system. And instead of one qubit from the bath, I'm going to have a sequence of them. So I'm going to start with a qubit that's of very small energy. Then I'm going to have a slightly high energy, then something higher, then higher, all the way to a final energy gap. So this is my, I could call it B1, B2, dot, 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 and then there's B capital N. So capital N is going to refer to the entirety of the process, whereas I'm going to use, so small n to refer to the nth part of this process. And the process is going to be the same as here, just repeated. So first I'm going to have U, S, B1, then U, S, B2, well, and U, S, B, 2, so on, until U, S, B, N. And the U, in each case, is still just the swap. OK? Now, so why have I done this? So the reason is the following. So I start with everything basically thermal. So even the system, you can look at it as a thermal state, because if the system has no Hamiltonian, then at any and every temperature, it's going to be at the maximally mixed state because there's just no energy gap. So you're equally probable to be in all of the states. So every one of these is essentially starting thermal at this temperature beta. So all of those states are also thermal. And now what I see is that, so when the system swaps with the first one, the change is not as much because now the energy gap of B1 is very small, which means that this one is also going to be close to the ma maximally mixed state. There's just going to be a slightly higher probability of being in the ground in the excited state. So both of these states, after the swap, they are no longer thermal, but they are close to thermal. They are close to what they were. And this keeps on being the case, because after swapping n times, the system is going to be, for example, the system will be here in, in the state corresponding to this one. And then it will swap with the one with a slightly higher energy gap. 
So essentially what happens is if you look at this process at the, at the end, what you get, so you start with, I'm going to label these now row zero, which is the state of the system. So initially you have row zero, tensor, let's say tau, yeah, tau one, tensor, tau two, dot, 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 tensor, tau n. And the final, after you do the swap, is really cyclic, because you swap with here, then you swap with there, and so on and so forth. So you end up with tau one, tensor, um, tau two, tensor, dot, dot, dot. Then there is something tensor tau n here. And, oh, sorry, no, it's the opposite way. Ha, sorry, I apologize. I, I did a cycle, but I did the opposite cycle of what I wanted. So this swaps, then this swaps, then this swaps. So you have, at the end, you're going to have tau n here. And then you're going to have uh, row 0, tensor tau 1, tensor dot, 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 tensor tau n minus 1. So you can see in, in every case, you have just changed the state to something that was next to it in the sequence. So we've got something now that is more isothermal in the sense that every state is close to what it, it used to be. OK, so now let's do this explicitly. So what is the nth step? OK, so the, in the nth step, I swap S with Bn. OK, and so I'm, I'm going to call the energy gap of this the energy gap is going to be equal to, or is defined rather as E B N. Just let's just call it E N because I don't need the extra subscript there. Okay, and the state transformation is going to be the following. So I'm going to have so after the n minus one steps my state of the system is going to be the n minus one state of the bath. So I'm, I'm basically going to have tau n minus one on the system, tensor tau n on the bath, and this is going to go to tau n, oh, sorry, here for this entirety, I should have used capital N, sorry. And tau n on the system, tensor tau n minus one on the bath, okay? So that's my f single step. Now I'm going to leave that up there and continue on the next board. So um, of interest to me are two important quantities. I want to know how the system entropy changed. And I also want to know what the change in energy of the bath is. And so the bath now refers to all of them together. But of course, in a single step, we just have to concentrate on that bath qubit that we used in that step. OK, so now what I'm going to do is, because I've broken things down into small steps, I am going to use uh, perturbative expansion. So this is, I'm going to label rho s is going to be some, uh, so not rho s, so tau n minus 1. I'm simply going to label as P, let's say n minus 1, 0, 0, plus 1 minus P, n minus 1, 1, 1. OK? And using the fact that it's a small step, I label the, the next one as P, n minus 1, plus delta P, 0, 0, plus 1 minus P, n minus 1 minus delta p 1 1 and the assumption is going to be that delta p is is small okay um, yes i'm taking delta p i'm taking plus delta p here because we we're, we're doing the protocol now in the direction of increasing the ground state of the system okay so i want to know now how delta s changes oh, i wanted to try and use this as long as possible before switching to black see how black is. doesn't look good. Uh, ah, it's OK. So what is delta S of the system? Now, 
Um, because the system and the path just switch, we can write delta s of the system is just minus delta s of the path. It's not important, but delta s of the path will be nice because it links to energy changes, so that's nice. Okay, now how do we calculate delta s of the path? So what we're going to do is we're going to write the following. So I'm going to say that delta s of a system, I'm going to write in the following manner. It's as a first order expansion. It's going to be ds by dp times the change, and now p is ground state population. because I use dp here. And then I have something that's order of um, the change in population squared, okay? Now, what is ds by dp? So I just write s in the usual form. So s is minus p log p minus one minus p log one minus p. And what we can find then is that ds by dp is, oh, this is Terrible. I'm going to have to switch to red, which is not perfect for the recording, but no option. So ds by dp is going to be, well, when you do all of this, you will get a log of p upon 1 minus p. Now let's check this. So if you differentiate this, you're going to get minus log p. Maybe you get the minus of that. Let me just check that. Yes, it's minus of that, indeed. Okay. Um, and so, so what this gives us here is that, uh, let me go to the next line. So I'm going to write now the change in entropy of the bath. So I say delta S of the bath. And all of this now, this is all in the n step. So I'm going to, going to write it as n because I'm going to sum over it later. This is going to be, so it's minus, minus log of P. Uh, so it's P n upon 1 minus p n times the delta p plus order of delta p squared. But this I can write in a nice form because we know this is the ground state population upon the excited state population. So this part here is just e to the beta times e n, the nth gap of the bath. So this is going to be minus beta E n delta p plus order of delta p squared. Okay, and so delta s of the, the change in entropy of the system in the n step is just negative of that. So it's beta E n delta p plus order of delta p squared. Just note that when I write order of something, the constants and everything are inside. So making it plus or minus is irrelevant. It's just something that's order of delta p squared. Okay. Why is this nice? Because now we can look at the change in uh, energy of the bath, and this is kind of simple. So we say, um, there is possibly a sign thing because the, well, we'll see it, because the bath has decreased in ground state population, but let me make this calculation first. So what is the change in energy of the bath? This is going to be, whatever energy gap the bath has, the final, so final uh, excited state population minus the initial excited state population. And what are these? So the final excited state population of the bath is going to be the initial excited state population of the system. So that's going to be one minus P to the N minus one. And then the, fine, uh, the initial one is, of course, what it started off with. So it's 1 minus p to the n minus 1 minus delta p. And so this is just minus minus plus. So it's just e n delta p. Yes. 
Okay, I think there is a slight. So yes. Yes. So there's a slight uh, change in the sign that I made from the previous lecture. So uh, note that. So everything I did he till here is correct. So ds by dp is is this. But the problem is that in the case of the bath, because of the swap, the ground state population decreases by delta p. So it's p n minus one plus delta p in the beginning, but at the final time it's p n minus one just on its own. So this is actually this is actually a minus sign here. So there's a minus delta p. So here I get a plus because p upon theta, and therefore here I get a minus. So sorry about that. All right, and so now I can. Oh, this is with an n. So I can link these together. So I say, so now what I can write is what is the work in total that I do? This is, of course, just the sum of the energy changes of bath in each step. So this is sum over uh, n delta Eb n, which is in turn uh, sum over n delta Eb n is. E, oh, uh, da, 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 yeah, e n delta p. But now I can write that in that form. So this is now sum over n of minus. Uh, so I take that down. So minus delta s over beta. So I, e n delta p I've just written by taking beta that way. And then of course I have an order of delta p squared there. And so of course. If I just sum up delta S n over all n, this is now equal to minus one over beta delta S total. Again, this is of the system, of the system. And then I have this plus sum over n order delta P squared. Actually, let me just write it down. So this thing here, when I have sum over n over order delta P squared, is going to be of the order of capital N delta P squared. Because it's something of the order of delta p squared, and I sum it over capital N times, so it's just capital N delta p squared. OK? Now, this is nice, because we've got something that actually looks off that, off that form. So we have uh, the, the work on one side. We have minus 1 over beta times delta s. So it's the same as that, just with a beta on the other side. And we only have now this extra error term. And this is the important one. The reason we've taken small changes is because now we can do a certain trick. We can simply say, take delta p itself to be of the order of n inverse. So we have two parameters here, how small each change is and how many steps we have. And well, actually, it's not take delta p of the order. It's delta p is going to be of the order of n inverse, because we've basically broken down our population change in n steps. So whatever our final population change is, we know that, so for example, we could simply take delta p to be equal to the full change delta p. Remember, this is just half for the case of erasure of the qubit divided by n. So we would we would organize our bath qubit such that the population of every one of them just changes by the same amount from the initial to the final. And when we do that, then this term here becomes of the order of n times n to the minus two, which is of the order of n inverse which is also the same as saying is of the order of delta p. This is the, these are equivalent. So I could either write it in terms of n, which is a number that grows bigger, or delta p, which is a number that grows smaller. And so this is good, because now we have the total thing is of the order of n inverse or of the order of delta p. So as these quantities become better, so n becomes larger, or delta p becomes smaller, we get closer and closer to saturating this. So w total is equal to this one. Now, Usually, as I said, when you write the order, there's constants here, negative or positive, doesn't matter. But here, in this case, you can know the sign of this simply because you know the inequality in, in um, the erasure bound. So this is going to be of a particular sign. Okay. And now, so to come back to the, the resource diverging, you see what is the resource here. In order to manage to saturate this and not have a, that our, our work diverges, we have to now trade it off against the number of steps. So the number of steps that I have to do to complete the protocol increases. There are, of course, different ways of looking at this. So when I write it in that form, it looks like I've done many, many steps. But another way of looking at it is, well, actually, if I write down all of these unitaries, they are actually, so if I write down a unitary between system and bath one, 
I can just tensor product identity on the rest. And it is actually a unitary on everything. It's just that it's only and it manages to involve system and bath one. So now I can combine all of these unitaries into a single one. I can say, well, I actually, from the beginning to the end of this process, I just do the, the composition of every one of these unitaries, which in turn is a single unitary operation. So in that sense, I've just done one step. But the trade-off here is that when I look at that single unitary operation, it is then a unitary on n plus 1 qubits. So you see here the, the, the notion of time in terms of like the number of steps and the notion of complexity in terms of the size of system that you're performing the unitary operation are a bit interchangeable in this, in this example. So you could consider that you're only doing it in one step, but the complexity is a resource that's diverging. You're doing a very, very complicated unitary on a very large system, or you can look at it the other way around. So there are, there are a couple of viewpoints here. OK. Are there any questions? Yes? Yes, exactly. Either the number of steps or the complexity of the unitary operation that you end up doing. Yes. Mm-hmm. No, no. So they are, as I said, so depending on, like, you, you said the sort of thing that you have to do, there are many results that sort of say this is impossible and this is why. Um, so, for example, one nice paper that, in fact, I think may have just been published yesterday. Um, so you can actually look at the, this. If you search for Landauer versus Nernst, um, then there's something about true cost of cooling. Sorry? Yes. Exactly. So you, you just see it, yeah. So it's uh, so this is a paper that uh, uh, I'm involved in, and uh, it was basically most of the people are uh, in v are were based in Vienna when this happened, and so there it actually sort of gives you an overview of these these things that you have this triangle of things, uh, these three different things: energy, complexity, and time, and you can see in different places like which ones have to diverge, which ones necessarily uh, don't have to, and it depends very much on the control because. So for example, one of the things I've done here is I've worked, as I, as I explained a few weeks back, in the coherent picture. I assume I can do any unitary, and I just account for energy by saying, well, what is the energy difference? That's the work cost at the end. There's also the incoherent picture where I say, no, I have to only use energy-preserving unitaries, and then I actually involve a, a, a third system from the hot part to make sure I'm only working in degenerate things. And it actually, so that makes it even worse. So in the case of just the unitary picture, one of these things has to diverge. In the case of the um, so in the case of the coherent picture, in the case of the incoherent uh, picture where I need energy-preserving unitaries, sometimes two of them have to diverge in, depending on which one you sort of keep fixed. So it depends. But yes, well, something will always always diverge uh, in every case. Um, so the actual, the, uh, the statement, for example, that just if you were to do a, a unitary operation that something would have to diverge. So the Reeb and Wolf paper that I mentioned last time when I was talking about the Erasure. They have, for example, um, in their paper, they do not. They not only derive the. Um, they not only go to the process that I did, but they also then consider. Imagine that my system was d-dimensional. Then I can put some bound on this error. I can say that this error has to be at least this large. So, you, and of course, the actual formulas they are, are complicated. But the the sort of takeaway is again that if you now take your system to be a fixed dimension, then there's only so close you can get to saturating it, you will actually be finitely away from it. And only in the limit d going to infinity do you actually get to saturate that. If you want to, um, yeah, if you want to keep the energy sort of non-divergent, which is consistent with this because d has to go to infinity as the number of steps increases. Yes? Yes. Um, my guess, my intuitive answer would be no, in the sense that, so there, I think, in fact, work, working on clocks as well is another field of work on which we'll talk about later. You, you tend to see a lot of the, um, 
the same scalings appear in different contexts. So like, you know, energy versus time and, and, and complexity and stuff like this. Sometimes they are, oh, they actually come from the same fundamental source, but sometimes they're just, they happen to have the same scaling, but they are of a different, like the derivation comes from different physical principles. So I don't, I would say, I don't know, but it doesn't feel the same. And, the, and one of the reasons is that some of the Heisenberg scalings and stuff really use the quantum nature in the sense that you, you have coherence, and so because you use coherence in a joint state, you can do better. Whereas here, we are using the quantized energy levels, but actually everything is still incoherent. There's no coherence, so that... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know, but may, maybe, I mean, maybe some results on the third law actually do use this sort of, or find a connection between them, but I, I don't know of them. Yeah. Yes, so uh, just to say, I, I would like continue the main, I'll, I'll continue answering questions, we will continue the main part of the lecture 10 minutes from us, so 10.40. Yes. No, so here it's it's not diverging because here basically I have summed this up and I get that it's equal to the change in entropy of the system, which is finite, and then I have the error term here. And so this error term can be made as small as we like. Ah, so okay, there is a there is a tricky thing. So in order to get closer and closer to the ground state, your final energy gap has to be higher and higher. So basically, the, the, now you have two different things that are diverging. And so you, you have to basically take one limit before the other. So you can, for every epsilon that you want to get to the ground state, you can find a large enough number that it will still not diverge. But that number has to keep up somehow with as close. So as close you get to the ground state, the number has to, be, has to grow to keep up with that. But you can do this so that you're always as close as you like. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, indeed. So if, if somebody was to say, oh, I fix the number n, then we are in trouble because then at some point, as the energy gap diverges, you cannot, the, the population change will have to become more and more violent, so there, or the energy change, so, yeah. Yes, so, uh, so during the break, there were some uh, interesting questions, so then some things that I would like to point out. So one of the things, actually, that um, is, I think, very attribute, to attributable to the QIT group in particular. So for example, um, Renato and then and Joe and all of the people who worked in the group is this, um, the notion of smoothed entropies. So uh, did you do smoothed entropies in the QIT course? Okay, so the I don't want to write any technical things because they're all complicated and it's unnecessary, but the notion of a smoothed entropy is where, so you can write, um, so what you do is you say, well, imagine that I don't know my state exactly, but I know it within a neighborhood. And so then I take the definition of an entropy, which could be the von Neumann entropy. It could be something called an alpha uh, Reni entropy. Did you do this in the QIT course? Okay, so this is, will I be able to do it from memory? I'm not sure. So the alpha uh, Reni entropy basically has, instead of taking the, um, the, just the populations, you take powers of the population. So your, your usual relative entropy is P N log Pn by Qn. Now imagine that you have something where you have the alphas instead. And of course, depending on which alphas here, you'll have something else there to, to balance it and with some normalization based on alpha. And alpha is in the range zero comma infinity. And this is just sort of a, this is basically a generalization of the entropies where for alpha equals to one, you get your normal von Neumann entropy. But for any other alphas, you get other entropies. And they all have some properties of entropies like the concavity and, and, and stuff. No, no, no. So this is this is just this is alpha equals to one. You get that, and for alpha not equal to one, so you get something else. But I, I it's there's one. I I don't remember it by heart, so I'm I'm not going to write it down instantly now. It was just a comment, but I would suggest you Google Reni entropy, and uh, and you will find this instantly. And so, for example, some of the things that you get. So, for instance, for alpha equals to zero 
you simply get a comparison between the rank of your initial of your of your state versus the other state. For alpha is equal to infinity, you get a comparison of the maximum element, and and things like this. So, um, so these are other entropies. Anyway, so I was talking about smoothed entropies. So in smoothed entropies, what you say is, given a state, what you do for its smoothed entropies, you say actually I take anything in the epsilon neighborhood of that state. So I construct an epsilon ball of that state. And the epsilon ball can be defined, for example, due to trace distance. So I say any state that is within epsilon trace distance of this. I take the smooth of whatever entropy I'm considering on anything in this, and I minimize over that. So the smoothed entropy somehow is, is, less, um, is, uh, is less susceptible to, to small changes in the, in the state. So for, in, for, for example, one of the things that is extremely susceptible to changes in the state is rank. Because I can change the rank of, of a state. If I have a, a state with zero eigenvalues, I can instantly make it full rank for a vanishingly small change by just adding tiny epsilons to all of them. And vice versa if I have something that's close to zero. So if you take the epsilon, the, the smoothed entropy there, you instantly get something that's not susceptible to rank anymore because you are taking within the epsilon ball. So um, yeah, so you, you have things like these, like smoothed entropies. Now, the reason I introduced them is because in this lecture, we've somehow talked about the second law of thermodynamics, and the third law of thermodynamics has been different things somehow. Like this, this is one that comes from one thing and something that comes from the other. But if you make statements based on these smoothed entropies, you actually tend to get uh, one statement that actually includes both. And the reason is because, so in terms of smoothed entropies, I'm, I'm kind of OK if I, I don't need to go somehow to the ground state. I just need to go to something that's epsilon close to the ground state. So this is always possible. And then I can do use the smoothed entropies to get uh, a statement of whether this is possible or not. And this includes both the second law and the third law with, in the sense that if I take epsilon goes to, going to 0, I immediately see at some point it'll become impossible because I, I make epsilon too small. So now my error, uh, I have no, I'm too susceptible to this. Um, so that includes the third law part. And the second law part is included in the fact that these smoothed entropies, when you have many systems, multiple systems, they all tend towards the von Neumann entropy. So even though you have for a single system or a single shot operation, you have to take into account epsilon as to you know, your, er your chance that you get to exactly the state or what error you, can, you have to get to that state. But if you do this on multiple copies for a fixed epsilon, you just get to the von Neumann entropy of the, the whole thing. And so then you get the, the second law. It's like, oh, my von Neumann, if my von Neumann entropy is OK, then I can, I can get here. So this would be, so, in, so let me give you a concrete example. Here in this case, if I say I have one system and I need to get it to the ground state, then I, I run into the third law. But if I have like multiple systems and I consider an epsilon ray, like error of getting to the ground state on, on a lot of them together, then I will go back just to the second law as something that tells me that I can do it or not. So, in, in some sense, you can, um, you can use the notion of smoothed entropies to sort of bridge the, bridge the gap. Um, OK, so that was one comment. Uh, now, let's continue. So the rest of the lecture, there are two parts to the rest of the lecture. The first part is now to just take this protocol and make a few comments about this. So the first comment is that So the energy scaling, the optimal energy scaling. So energy scaling. And what I mean is by energy scaling is En is equal to some function of n, essentially. right? So the original uh, paper by Paul Skripchik that introduced this uh, protocol, for simplicity, you took the uh, linear energy scaling. So you just split the energy gap that you have from the beginning here, it's degenerate to the final one. You just split it into uh, equal contributions, and then you get linear energy scaling. You could do the other way around. You could split the population change, and you could make it linear. Um, this, so it's not, so the optimal version of this is not linear. Now, what do I mean by optimal? I mean the, the one that minimizes the error. So I define my question. I say, well, I can tell you a number of steps you can use. So you have 100 steps. I can tell you the final state, so that determines the final qubit you will swap with. And then you are allowed to do any sequence of qubits in between and, and swap. And in each case, you're going to get a different error. So whatever error term 
appears here, you can actually calculate it then analytically it's going to be different. And then you can ask the question, well, what's the best way of splitting this? And it's not linear in terms of energy. It's not linear in terms of population. It's something more complicated. This is something that people um, uh, in Geneva have actually uh, found what the, well, have found for large n how it has to look. It's a complicated trigonometric expression. But the important thing to say is that it's, it's, it's not linear. Um, yes? No, it's not that either. So it, it, if it tends to look more like that than looking like the energy is the same. But, but even there, it's not exactly that. It has like tan hyperbolics and, and it says lots of trigonometric things there. Um, the second comment to make is, so the way we analyzed the error here was really from the differential side. So we said, let's take a small step. But one of the things you can do is you can do it from the in, in, integral side as well. And that, in fact, gives you um, a very nice analytical bound on what the error is. And what I mean is the following. So what you can do on a graph is you can say, let's, let's plot P, so the population uh, in the ground state, as a function of EB, right? So uh, well, E, basically. And, and we know what this, this graph is. So we know the population in the ground state is 1 upon 1 plus e to the minus beta EB. So if this is population 1 and this is population half, for example, then we know that so e, B, e equals to 0. Energy gap equals 0 means you're maximally mixed, so you're here. And so then this is something that's going to rise. And of course, it's going to diverge as you get closer and closer to 1 in the ground state, right? OK. And what we've basically done in this protocol is we've taken, we've broken this chain change into a number of steps. So like this step, this step, this step, this step, this step. And we stop at some point. Let's say this is our final step here. So P final. And this is our P initial. And if you calculate the actual, um, the actual uh, work cost, what you will see is that it's the sum of these things. So you basically do. you basically end up getting the area under the dotted curve. Okay, So because it's just the, the energy of the next thing times the population difference between this and this. So you end up getting this, this energy under this curve. And now, what you, so you can immediately see why, why this whole thing works. If I take the step size smaller and smaller, I go from this sum to the integral. So this is really the Riemann sum corresponding to the integral. And now you can also use this to calculate. So you, you can say, well, um, you can use the left Riemann sum and the right Riemann sum to give bounds on what the actual so what the actual work cost is versus what the what you would have if you stayed along the line and what you have if you stay along the line is precisely this quantity here w total is given by minus one over beta delta s so you could use that thing as well and and in fact that that one appears in the paper that I said Landau versus Nernst um, in there is a I think maybe the final appendix that has the same protocol done in detail. So that's another way, and then you get a, you really get a, a closed form expression for what the bound well not for what the error is, but how large the error can be in terms of n and delta p, and it has of course the same scaling. Okay, so that's uh, one more comment, and yes, there's no more. Well, the third comment I've written, I think I've already said. So basically, what we've done is so the reason reversibility works is because we manage a first order change in the quantity of interest, like the entropy, and we it only costs us a second order error in in the in sort of the uh, in lambda range in the work cost that we would like to get to. So, because I have first order and second order, then I can make a finite change in one and for first order change in the other. So this is why mathematically it works. Okay, so now we stay on the protocol, but we consider now a different question. And we consider generalizations of this. Okay. So, what are the generalizations? So, the simplest one is just the reverse. OK, so here, the way I constructed it was, well, we have a, we, we start in the maximally mixed state. 
and then we want to go to a pure state, we can consider the reverse. I start from a, max, uh, from a pure state, and I go to the maximum limit state. Now, what's going to happen there, instead of putting energy in, I'm going to extract energy. I basically extract energy from the path, but I'm going to extract more and more, depending again on how many steps I put, and the maximum I can extract again is given by um, the, the, the lambda erasure cost. So this is now work extraction. OK, so that's very simple. The second generalization I can make is, well, initial state is not thermal. But I'll, I'll keep it as still diagonal, because everything that we're working with is still um, with in the incoherent picture, so still all diagonal states. So now the question is, imagine that I had a, a state of the system. And it didn't start in, so the, so for simplicity, I say my, my Hamiltonian of the system was still zero, so my, my system was degenerate. But my initial state of the system was not maximally mixed, was something else. And I wanted to erase it. And I want to construct this protocol. Well, what should I do? And now the, the, the concept that you, the, of reversibility should immediately say what the answer is. So basically, the reason we started with the first path qubit being of small energy gap is because then it would give us a state that was very similar to the state of my system initially. And it just happened that the energy also looked the same because my system also started at the same temperature, so both of them were equivalent. But if my system doesn't start at the, at the same temperature, it starts in a different state, what I still have to ensure is that I match the state of my system to the first thing I swap. So basically, instead of starting, so one of the things I could do there, which I didn't, by the way, is I could just for, um, I don't know what, uh, like uh, I could put a redundant path qubit and call it zero. So I have B1 to Bn but I could, I could put a bath qubit and call it B0. And in that protocol, B0 would have exactly the same Hamiltonian as S. So that would be the one that is the same as S. I wouldn't use it, but it, it sort of matches the state of the system. And now I can do this in every protocol. And what I, ha I need here when the initial state is not thermal is that my rho of B0 has to be equal to rho of S. And then, of course, and, and now what that will do is that will determine what the energy gap of B0 is. So whatever the state of rho s is, I need to take that as the state of the path. But here now, given that the populations, so let me say that rho s is equal to p0, 0, 0 plus 1 minus p, 1, 1, this will mean that rho b has to be the same. So rho b, 0 has to be equal to rho s. So it has to have the same p in 0, 0. But that means that p must be equal to 1 upon 1 plus e to the minus beta times e of B0. And that determines what E of B0 is. And once I have E of B0, of course, my e, e of Bn, the last one, is determined by what final state I want to reach. But now I can plug it between them. So it's the same concept of reversibility. If I start not thermal, I simply choose the state of the bath, the first one to be one that's close to what my initial state of the system is. So I can repeat the same protocol. You'll get exactly, exactly the same answer for everything. OK. The third generalization, and, and this one is important, is now h of the system is not equal to 0. Okay, So what happens in that case? Um, it's actually quite simple. So imagine that I did this whole protocol uh, from there, but I started with h of the system not being 0. Well, the only thing that would change when I considered the work cost, so here, I, here when I considered the work cost, I just took the change in energy of the path. So now what I would do is I would change, say the work total is the change in energy of the path plus the change in energy of the system. And so that I don't even have to put analytic forms for because I can just say, well, the final change in energy of the system, I can just add it in here. So what I will have then is that the work cost in total of, um, yeah, the work cost total is going to be equal to, and I'm still going to have these terms all appearing. So I'm still going to have minus 1 over beta delta S of the system. But then I'm going to have the full change in energy, and this is total, the full change in energy of the system, so ES total. And then, of course, the, the error, so order of n delta p squared. But this here, you could recognize, this is just the definition of delta F S, where F is equal to E minus K T S, which is the same as S over beta. E minus I 
should be e minus t s. Okay. Huh. There is somewhere where I either assumed k was equal to one, and then I didn't put it, and now it's reappeared somewhere. So there's okay. There's some there's some problem here. I will try and resolve it next time. But um, the major thing to say is, again, here you have that the work in total that you have to do has to match the change in free energy of the system. And of course, there's an error. I'm sorry about the, the there's something about the k, but I'm not entirely sure. Ah, I know where it is. It's because he, I assumed when I took the entropy, I actually have to take the entropy to be k times this, the, the thermodynamic entropy. So there's actually going to be a k that appears all over here. And that was what I took to be zero. So Maybe I should just now assume k is equal to 1 for this particular argument and say, let's see this. Yeah. Everything is consistent if you keep track of k. Um, yes. Something I was going to say about this, yes. So one of the nice things about uh, the free energy is there's another way of looking at the free energy, which is, let me put it here because it's a very small comment. So when I have d rho b prime given rho b, if rho of b is a Gibbs state, e to the minus beta hb upon zb, then what you can check is that this is actually equal to the free energy difference, uh, the free energy of rho b prime minus the free energy of rho b, plus, I think, an additive constant that depends on the partition function, but doesn't depend on rho b prime. So one of the so it's nice because so it, what it means is the relative entropy of any state to a thermal state is basically given by the free energy difference, the extra free energy that that has over the thermal state plus a constant. But it also implies that the minimum free energy is of the thermal state. So if I define a temperature beta and I say what is the state with respect to to beta that has, has the minimum thermal energy with respect to that beta or t, whichever way I look at it, then this already tells us what the answer is because I know that the, the, to, to minimize this, I have to make this as small as possible, but the smallest possible value of this is zero, and that's when rho b prime is equal to rho b, so I know that the, the free energy of the thermal state is the one that's uh, minimal for a particular temperature. Okay, It's another way of looking at free energy. Okay, I take that back up. Okay, uh, yes, so there was one. So the final comment then to make, okay, I'm gonna have to erase. Yeah, so the final comment to make now is when you combine these three, these three generalizations, what you see is that, first of all, you see that there are essentially two modes of operation that you can use this process in. The first mode of operation is you start with a state that's in equilibrium and you want to take it out of equilibrium. So what do I mean by in equilibrium? I mean it's thermal. So the initial erasure that we did was of this example. We started with a state that was maximally mixed, so it was a thermal state with respect to the temperature of the bath, but we wanted it to be a fewer states, so that's very much not in equilibrium with the bath. So when you do this, of course you need to put in energy and the energy cost is given by this bound by Landau, and now you see that you can actually get close to the Landau bound if you use a greater number of steps or a greater energy, something like that works. Um, but then there's the other way around, where you start with a system that is out of equilibrium, and then you use a protocol such as this to bring it back into equilibrium, but in doing so, you are able to extract energy or extract some things. So I realize that Everything I say is probably not going to be recorded. That's okay, so maybe I'll repeat it again. Like that. Yeah. So we have essentially two modes of operation. So the first case here, so case one, is rho s in equilibrium, and then you go out of equilibrium. And this, so this includes erasure, 
or you can call it cooling. So one of the things to say is, when I consider a Hamiltonian for the system, I can look at the same process. So if I have a Hamiltonian for the system, then suddenly there's a ground state and an excited state because they're different energies. So everything that we did in taking the state to the cl as close as possible to zero can be cast in the form of cooling. So that's now actually an example of uh, using this, all of this protocol to cool a system. Um, and then there's case two, which is rho s in equilibrium. Oh, sorry, out, out of equilibrium. And you take it to equilibrium, and this is just work extraction. So what you do is, essentially, anything that's not thermal is a resource. And this is also the reason why if you have two heat paths, you have a resource, because from the perspective of one of the paths, the other one is out of equilibrium. So you can use a heat flow between them to do something useful. So this is now work extraction. And of course, I mean, I can add a, a third case here, which is just rho s out of equilibrium, and you just stay out of equilibrium. So basically now this, this just means the system starts in some arbitrary diagonal state, and you want it to take it to another arbitrary diagonal state. Well, you can do this. This is basically now completely general state transformation, which includes everything you've seen in the first two cases. And you can do this also with the same protocol. And we know why, how you, you start. So we know how to determine what the zero bath state is. It has to be the energy, the energy of the bath has to be chosen to exactly match your system. So that's zero. And the final one has to just match your final desired state. And then you just interpolate between them, and you get an arbitrary protocol. Which actually reminds me, there's one more generalization. I don't know how I forgot, which is uh, the fourth is higher dimensions. And the thing is, there's really nothing more to say here because the same concept holds. So imagine that I have some system that's higher dimensions that starts in an arbitrary state. Then all I have to do to start the protocol, I define my zero state of the bath to be something of the same dimension. And I simply have to pick the Hamiltonian so that the populations match. And you can always do this. You, you're basically, what you're doing is you're solving, a, you're finding the log of the, of the state of the system, and then that determines the Hamiltonian because the Gibbs state is exponential of the, of the Hamiltonian. So you can always do that. And then, of course, now, depending on what my final desired state of the system is, I do the same thing to pick the final state of the bath, and then I interpolate between them. So, of course, that interpolation, depending on what state transformation you have, is, can be weird. It means your, each of your energy gaps is, has a different pathway. It may be increasing, maybe decreasing. Something else might be happening. But you can do everything that we just did, on something of higher dimension, and that would be also completely fine. Yeah? Uh, no, so, so in this, when I hear now when I say equilibrium, I mean it's thermal. Yeah, in, in the case that my system Hamiltonian was zero, that was the same as maximally mixed. So I was, now when I did this example, I was still talking about, well, so that would be maximally mixed. But when the system is, uh, Hamiltonian is not zero, then equilibrium means you start thermal, yeah. But this is more general somehow. This includes the special case of degenerate systems as, as well as the others, yeah. Okay, very good. Um, all right, are there any more questions about the protocol for erasure or state transformation in general? All right, so then in that case, we move to a, not new, but something that's been implicit in all of the things that we've done, which is I'm going to talk now about work storage system. So, so what we've done so far in this, this lecture as well as the previous one is we just took u, let's say, system bath, rho system bath, u dagger. That was our transformation. And then we said w is just the, the change in the average energy of this. So trace of h system bath times rho sp prime minus rho sp. And of course, you can always, etch, this is usually a sum Hamiltonian, so you can split it. So I'm not going through that detail now. So now what I want to do is I want to consider, well, what happens if you want to include all of your energy sources within the description explicitly? So this is to make this somehow a fully closed system description. So now we go to, a, I would say, a, well, I'm not sure what to call this description, but so alternately, what we do, 
in order to do that, I have to include a system that actually serves as an energy source. So now I have U system bath, and I'm going to call it W for work source. And I have rho S. So actually, let me write it this way, rho B tensor rho W, U S B W dagger. And now what is the work cost? The, the, the point of including this explicitly is so that I, I didn't have to consider external energies, which means that now I have the condition U S B W commutes with H S plus H B plus H W. And remember this, when I write this, it's implicitly H S tensor identity B tensor identity W, et cetera, okay, for all of them. So this commutes. And this ensures now that the energy of the total thing is remaining constant, which means that now I could still do the same calculation I did before. W is equal to trace of this thing. And this, in turn, this is going to imply that W is exactly equal to that. But because the total energy has remained the same, uh, and so the total energy difference is zero, whatever energy difference is here is going to be reflected in a negative energy difference there. So it's going to be minus trace of H W rho W minus rho W. Okay, so I put a minus there, so I'll write inside the same way. And the reason is because this term plus this term has to be zero for global energy conservation because of the unitary commuting. Okay, now, of course, there's an obvious problem you can see here. Well, I have a unitary. This is what I really want to do. I want to do USP on system and bath. I can involve a, a weight, but this is no guarantee that when I do this, the effect on the system and bath is going to co exactly correspond to this. So now we would like to say, well, when is it the case that I can actually um, mimic the operation on the system and bath well enough that I say, I'm, I'm kind of doing this. I've just included the work source explicitly. So I give you the simplest and example of a work source, which is already an idealization. So I say my um, Hamiltonian of the work source is just going to be x operator. So this, I'm really thinking of a weight now. So I'm really raising a weight. I have a continuous degree of freedom. It's associated to height, and I'm, I'm raising this. Now, I could write g and stuff, but then that g would appear everywhere. So for simplicity, I'm just going to keep it x. Now, what do I do? So let me write my initial USB, right? So I have USB that I wanted to do. And I can write it in terms of the energy basis uh, in any manner. So let me write it now as sum over, yeah, I, J, K, L. And I would have EI on the system tensor. E J on the path, and then wow, is this a nice way of writing it? No, let me let me. Oh, this is just notation quibbles, but still, <coughs> let me just write it the same way. So, E I, E J, on the system, tensor, E K, E L on the bath, and then arbitrary constants in before that, so C, I, J, K, L. OK? So this is just an, I mean, honestly, here I've just written an arbitrary matrix, um, not just a unitary. Of course, being a unitary, C, I, J, K will have special properties. But this is my um, original unitary. I can always express it in this form, right? And now the problem is I see here that what I've done, so in each of these terms, I've taken E, J, and put it on EI, and I've taken EL and put it on EK. So I basically have, oh, that's bad. There's nothing else. So let me, OK, let me try and use the black. So I have an EI minus EJ plus EL minus EK here, change in energy corresponding to this term. And so now to make this energy preserving, given the nice weight that I've introduced, I simply do USBW is equal to the same sum, i, j, k, l, c, i, j, k, l, e, i, tensor, e, j. I'm sorry, not tensor. That's just a thing. Now I have a tensor. Okay. And what I do it is that I tensor this with a translation operator on the weight. And the translation operator is just one that 
mimics this. So since I've increased an energy there, the translation operator has to do the negative of that. So it's minus EI minus EJ minus EL minus EK. Now, just to, to say, so I hope I don't have to write the translation operator. It's just if I have a thing of X, uh, the translation operator A on X gives you the state X plus A. That's just that. Yeah? Oh, J, K, L, I minus J. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yes, yes. Yes. E, I minus E, J. I apologize. It's K, L, K, L. Yeah. OK. Now, what I've done here so far is I've basically managed to satisfy the condition of energy preservation. I've ensured that this, you, you see now in every term here, the energy doesn't change. Whatever energy changes on the system and bath, that same energy, the negative of that energy difference is going to be appear on the weight. So by constructing it this way, it's very easy to check that I'm going to have the commutation relation, and that's still going to hold. Okay, So that's, that's fine. What remains, however, is to check that when we do this, we actually get what we wanted on the system and bath. And that is not always possible unless you have the state of the bath being of a particular form. So let's take a very simple example. I'm going to take the swap, so the qubit swap. OK, so I have my rho system and bath, which was equal to this in the beginning. So P00, P01, P10, P11, diagonal state, zeros everywhere else. So just to write this explicitly, P00 is with 00. Um, sorry, P00 is with 00, 00, 00 on system and bath plus P01 is with 0, 01, 0, 01 on system and bath, plus so on and so forth, OK? And I write, um, and I say my row of the weight was just some psi psi, whatever it is. Don't know what it is, OK? So actually, but I, I'm not, I don't even need to write it as psi psi. I just, I just keep it. Row of the weight is whatever it was. OK. And now I do, I do the following thing. I, I do the swap. But I modify it in the form that I just did here. So I, I write the swap unitary, but I add translation operators everywhere. So what's going to happen? My USBW is going to be, so I know what happens in the swap unitary. So 0, 0 stays 0, 0. And because no energy has changed, this is going to be tensor identity on the weight. The same thing for 1, 1, 1, 1, tensor identity on the weight. But now I'm going to have 1, 0 from 0, 1, tensor, that's P. And here the weight is going to go. So the energy of the system has increased. The energy of the bath has decreased. So the translation operator increases by the bath, the decreases by the energy. And then the same, what the, well, the commission conjugate. There, OK? So what is my final state of system, bath, and weight? It's going to be, so I can write the initial state as each of these tensor, the uh, weight row. So it's going to be now, I'm going to keep P00, 0, 0, uh, 0 um, plus, I'm going to combine this, P11, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And this is just going to be tensored row of the weight as it was, because nothing has happened in that case. Then I have P1. 0 on 0, 1, 0, 1 on system and bath. But this came from, so 0, 1 at the end. So this is going to be gamma ES minus EB, row weight gamma dagger ES minus EB. So this comes from this term. Sorry, I wrote it the, should have written it the other way, but it's fine. Plus P, 0, 1, and the same thing, 1, 0, 1, 0, tensor gamma EB minus ES, row weight gamma dagger EB minus ES. Very good. All right. I don't need those brackets, actually. OK, so now we look at two things. So the first thing we look at is what is 
the trace, so one of the things we want is that rho S B prime is equal to just U S B rho S B U S B. Well, we would like it to be. This is the question mark. U S B dagger because that would be good for us. So we calculate. Let's just calculate what rho S B prime is here. So I have to take the trace of the weight of rho S B W prime. And so for each of these cases, I, I take the trace. And, and here, actually, we get something that's good. 0, 0, 0, 0, plus 1, 1, 1, 1, plus, well, it's as we expect. Because the trace of every one of these terms, this is just the weight. This is the weight shifted. Um, they're all still completely fine. 1, 0, 1, 0, OK? One of the ways of writing this, by the way, if you, if you want to write it in matrix form, is to still keep it that way, as I've written there, but row 0, 0, but then you put row weight in. So this is actually a matrix where each one of these elements now turns into a matrix with the, with the weight state. This is instead of writing tensor with the weight, which is only good for when it's a tensor product, but when it's correlated, it's not so good. Um, P10 with gamma rho gamma dagger, P101 uh, with the same thing, and P11 with just row weight. Because I'm not going to write down the full, the gammas, the gammas are from here. So in, here you can see when you take the partial trace, in each block you're just tracing over this weight states in each one of them, and they're all fine. So this is actually nice because this is just what you would expect from just doing the swap on rho SP, U SP dagger, okay? But what has changed is rho weight prime. So, yes. So rho weight prime, if I, if I do the, uh, the whole trace and stuff, I'm going to get now P00 plus P11 times the original state of the weight. With P10, I'm going to get this state, the state that's translated one way. And with P01, I'm going to get the state that's translated the other way. So my weight has gone from whatever state it was to something that's different. Now, one of the things that I mentioned in, in a previous class and one of the things you will need for, to solve one of the, uh, or it'll come up in one of the tutorial questions you have, is the fact that an ideal work source doesn't change in entropy much, right? So we want that whatever the change of state of the weight is, that the entropy of it does not increase too much. Um, do I have time to do this? Let me do it in few minutes. So imagine two cases. So case one is where I take the state of the weight to be really x equals to 0. OK, so the state of the weight was pure state at, at 0 height. Then what happens is, OK, this is the x is equal to 0 state. This is going to be another state translated up by something. This is going to be another state translated down by something. But the important part is that by taking the weight to be a pure state, Every one of these is orthogonal to the other because they are different positions. So really speaking, in this case here, I get that rho weight is really a mixture. So it's P00 plus P11, this x equals to 0 state, plus something that's orthogonal. So I'll have a x equals to plus a, whatever that a is, x equals to plus a. And then I have something with something here, plus something here with x equals to minus a because the third term is exactly the opposite. And now if I take the entropy of the state, so the, here the entropy of the weight is 0. But here now the entropy of uh, row weight prime, sorry. The entropy of the weight at the end is not equal to 0. Because of course, this is not, uh, these are three different states. We're in a mixture of them. So it's going to be you know this times log of this plus whatever. So it's not a 0 entropy state. So this is clearly not so nice, because it, the weight has changed entropy quite a bit, or at least somewhat. So the second case to take, which I'm not going to do in, in full because I think it will appear in the, in the tutorial, is where you take the weight to be a broad state. So you take the weight, uh, rho weight, to be psi psi. And for example, you can take that, so psi is a wave function over, over x. And you can take that the wave function itself is 
1 over two, uh, square root of 2L for x um, within, say, minus L to x to L and 0 otherwise. OK? So it's, it's basically a wave function from minus L to L. And why would I do this? Because now imagine that L is extremely large. In print, and, and particularly, L is much larger than this value of A, this EB minus ES that I'm translating it by. Then what I get here is I can do the same calculation. So I start with psi psi. But my row weight final, with some probability, will be centered around 0. With some probability, will be moved up. But, and some probability moved down. But each one of these three states now, this original state, the moved up and the moved down one, if my initial wave function was broad enough, all of these states overlap quite a bit. So if, if L is much larger than this little bit that I've moved, I get three states. I'll just write them here. So if this is the x thing. I have one state here, one state here, and one state here. And so you see, as L, which is the width of this, increases more and more, the overlap is going to increase more and more. And when we do that and we calculate the entropy, then what's going to happen is the overlapping terms is going to, are going to appear here. And we will see then that the entropy gets smaller and smaller until the point when L goes to infinity. You will get a zero change in entropy because the wave function seems like it hasn't changed at all when it's moved by such a small amount. And so this is why an ideal work source is one which has a lot of breadth, basically, in energy. In order, and essentially, by being broad in energy, it ensures that small changes in energy do not actually change its state much. So that would be the ideal work source. OK, I'm going to conclude here. Um, and I will answer any questions, but that concludes the lecture.